And hi, my name is Ilanka Dunin. Can you hear me in the back there? Okay. So um, I'd like to just ask a couple questions here because uh, I've been speaking at DragonCon for many years. How many of you have heard me speak at DragonCon before? Okay, welcome back. Um, how many of you, aside from reading in the program book, have heard of Cryptos? How many have heard of the Voynich Manuscript? Oh, okay. How many have ever tried your hand at cracking one of them? <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, hopefully by the end of this, I will um, have explained a bit about what both of them are. And maybe those of you that are sort of working on it might have a bit more information, might not. Um, a little bit more about my history with these codes. It actually starts with DragonCon. Um, I've been a, a speaker here on and off since 1998. And at one of the years, I think it was in the 90s, I was actually here speaking at the Electronic Frontiers track uh, about games. That's uh, my job, I make computer games. And because I was here at the track, I got to meet the other speakers at the track where hackers were coming in and speaking about computer security, how sh people should lock up their computers so the bad guys shouldn't get in. And by meeting those hackers, um, I heard about a code that had been released at a convention called Freaknik 3. That's Freaknik with P-H-R-E-A-K. Um, and it was, a code, it was a challenge to the attendees at the conference. This is a, a hacker convention in Nashville and no one had cracked it. So they were handing out flyers with the code on it and they were saying, hey, if anybody can crack it, there's a prize for cracking this code. So I picked up all the stuff you get, like with all the other stuff you get at a convention. I took it home to me. I was living in St. Louis at the time. And um, uh, long story short, I kind of got fiddling with it and I cracked it. It took me 10 days, uh, a very antisocial 10 days. And um, I cracked it and I won the prize, which was a free trip to a hacker con, free drinks, t-shirts, hotel, the whole nine yards. Um, and then I went around cracking a bunch of other codes in the hacker scene. I've actually cracked so many that I've been banned from competition. <laughs> um, at, the, at the hacker convention, which was AtlantaCon, the codes come out on a piece of paper and the code was at the top of the paper and at the bottom it said note past puzzle solvers are ineligible for prizes associated with solving the Atlanticon puzzle give someone else a chance Ilanka uh, <laughs> so I cracked that one too um, <laughs> and um, so I, I had kind of all this experience and uh, and then September 11th, 2001 happened, a horrible day. And uh, I was as enraged as everyone else by what had happened. And I was wondering if maybe I could help with the war on terrorism, sort of like in England during World War II with Bletchley Park. They needed a lot of people to help with the code cracking effort. And so they were reaching out to people in the public. And so um, I called out my, I called my local FBI in the St. Louis and I said, hey, you know, can, can I help with the uh, war on terrorism? And they said, no um, and then I uh, but I was persistent and uh, I kept calling back and finally I got an agent who said well what is it you know about and I started listing all these different kinds of code systems that I knew how to crack and one of them I listed was something called steganography and he said hey you know we've been hearing rumors that Al-Qaeda might have been using steganography as a way of planning the September 11th attacks and and we're here in the St. Louis field office cryptography isn't really our mission um, uh, but maybe you could kind of put together a little talk about what steganography is and I said great sure and I think they thought I was going to come in and do like a little 10 minute talk but I ended up giving like a 70 slide PowerPoint presentation about what steganography was it's a way of hiding things inside of pictures and um, and how I didn't think that Al-Qaeda was using it, but I tracked down where the rumors were coming from. It was because of a, a mosque in Milan uh, that had been uh, uh, invaded by the Italian police, and they caught a bunch of Al-Qaeda members there, and they captured them and captured their laptop computers. And on these computers were pictures of naked women. And so the Italian tabloids got a hold of that and went crazy with it, like, oh my God, pictures of naked women on uh, laptops belonging to the strict Muslim Al-Qaeda, what were they using these pictures for? And so they came up with this thing of they must have been hiding messages inside of the pictures, um, and that was their way of planning the attacks. And uh, I was like, no, sometimes porn is just porn. Um, 
<laughs> and and kind of looking at the kind of codes that Al Qaeda did use. And at the time, it was very simple codes. Like if they wanted, if they were talking on a cell phone, and they wanted to say FBI instead of saying FBI, they might say food and beverage industry. Um, so it, it was really very simplistic stuff. But um, as I got more involved with this, this was kind of a track of my life. As I gave the talk to the FBI, and it turned out to be popular. I was getting invited to other places. I gave the talks to the Secret Service and postal inspectors and customs agents and universities and other hacker cons. And, and along with, so that was one track of my life. And on this other track of my life, the Freaknik code had kind of led to this thing where I was cracking codes all over the place. And the Freaknik 3 code, actually, it was, it was written in a very devious way by a hacker named Johnny X, who's, who's also here at DragonCon. Uh, he'll be at the Hacking 201 panel tonight if anybody comes there. Yeah, Hacking 201. Um, and uh, it was a series of layers, and it was different code systems, and there were also dead ends in it, like go solve this, and aha, this is a this dead end, you gotta go solve this. And one of the things I solved led me to CIA.gov, the CIA website, and it was like go solve this, and it was a picture of the sculpture up there called Cryptos. Um, Cryptos, it's a sculpture, it's in the center of CIA headquarters, it's about 12 feet tall, 20 feet long. It has these wavy metal sheets coming out of it with about 2,000 characters. It has four codes on it. It's a challenge to the, the agents at the CIA. Three of those codes have been solved and had been solved in 1999, right around the time that Freaknik 3 was being planned. And so the Freaknik 3 code was like, okay, go solve this. There's four codes, three have been solved. The fourth hasn't been solved. It's now one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. Go crack it. And I'm like, yeah, okay, haha. Ha. And it was just a joke. And I went on and I cracked the rest of the code, um, the Freaknik code. And then, um, but I kept thinking about this sculpture, Cryptos, Cryptos. And boy, I'd love to get in there and, and, and see it at one time. And um, after September 11th, another kind of sidetrack of my life was I had a cousin who had a very close call on the morning of September 11th. Um, he works for the government and he was actually on his way to the Pentagon to give a talk on. Um, I think it was some biochem warfare defense cleanup areas. And um, he was late for the talk because his printer uh, was giving him trouble. And he, he got the printer thing worked out and then he's on his way to the Pentagon and he was checking his cell phone for messages. His cell phone actually crashed because of all the messages from people saying, a plane just hit the Pentagon, don't go. Um, so And the plane actually hit where he was supposed to be. So some of the people he was supposed to brief w were killed. So after September 11th, uh, one of the things I did was I flew out to Washington, D.C. to hug my cousin. And, uh, and then we went to the Pentagon, and, and we put a, a little American flag at the memorial there. And then we were kind of driving around. And he said, you know, Ilanka, this is your, your first time in Washington, D.C. Is there anything else you'd like to see? And I'm like, well, no, you, I'm just glad to see you. And he says, okay, that's nice. I like to see you too. But, you know, Washington, D.C. kind of has a lot of, you know, landmarks and, and things that tourists come to see. And I'm like, well, there's this crypto sculpture over at, in CIA headquarters. And he says, okay, CIA headquarters is in Langley. Um, let's see if we can go find it. And we had trouble because we couldn't figure out where CIA headquarters was. There's no street address for <laughs> CIA headquarters. At the time, there was no map quest. There was no Google Maps. Um, but uh, I was persistent, and I kept Googling, and I found a couple places where people did what was called poor security. Like one guy said, um, oh, uh, his kid's soccer match, and he was giving directions to the soccer match, and he was saying, okay, take this highway, and you'll see the sign for the CIA. Now, past that, you're going to turn right, and that's where the soccer field's going to be. Um, also, I sort of knew where the building, or what the building looked like, because I'd seen Tom Clancy movies, where they had this thing like, CIA headquarters, <laughs> CIA, and so I sort of knew what the building was shaped like, and so I got some satellite reconnaissance pictures, sort of like today's Google Earth, um, of what what Langley, Virginia looked like, and I found the outline of the building, and I had those directions to the soccer field, and um, put it all together. So my cousin and I drove by, 
And we thought we were just going to like take the turn and find the service road around the CIA and kind of just kind of go and peek over the wall, you know, and see if we could see cryptos. It, it didn't work like that. We, we, we took the exit and there's no service road. There's just a really big gate with barbed wire and a guard shack with big guys with guns who come pouring out who are asking a very reasonable question at that time after September 11th. Who are you and why are you here? So my cousin and I are like, can we talk our way into CIA? And, and so we were like saying, well, you know, we're here to see cryptos. And the, the guards kind of relaxed a little bit and they said, sorry, only people with official business can come in. And so then I'm thinking, oh, well, is there like a public tour day? And they said, sorry, no, official business only. And like, can I get an invitation for my congressman uh, to come in? And they go, no, no, sorry, official business only. And, and we're kind of running through all these things and, and thinking this isn't going to work. And like I said, these are big guys with guns. <laughs> and so we finally said, OK, we, we drove away. But then I'm thinking official business only, official business only. So now we, we switch back to this other part of my life where I'm giving talks about steganography uh, to various government agencies. And I'm like, ping, you know, can I use this talk about steganography as a way of talking my or, you know, official business that's going to get me into CIA headquarters? And so then I'm like, well, how do I get a contact? And when I put together my talk about steganography, because it's a way of hiding messages inside of pictures, I had to have a slide which was before and after. You had to have a picture with nothing hidden inside of it, and then a picture with something hidden inside of it uh, to show that you really can't see the difference because the message is hidden in the, the bits of the picture. And I was, what picture? Should I use a picture of a flower? Should I use a picture of a, oh, I'll use a picture of crypto. So. I had this image actually that I downloaded from the CI website that I would use for my before and after pictures because I hid something in the picture. It was on my slide, not on the on the CI website. And then when I do my presentation about steganography and I'd show my slide before and after, and I'd say, oh, by the way, that's sculpt it's called Cryptos. It's a CIA headquarters. Boy, I'd love to give my talk at CIA someday. <laughs> and and so I gave my talk at the FBI and Secret Service and Customs Agents and Postal Inspectors and U.S. Attorney General. Boy, I'd love to give this talk at CIA someday. Nobody bites. Then I'm giving the talk at DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention in the world. Has anybody here ever been to DEF CON? Yeah, that will admit it. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's a big hacker convention in Las Vegas. At this time, it was at the Alexis Park Hotel. So the big roof tent. And uh, I was giving my talk on steganography there. So there's like a thousand people in this roof tent. And I'm going through my talk, da, 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 and boy, I'd love to give this talk at CIA someday. And da, da, da. So at the end of the talk, people come up to you, they give you business cards, they chat about different things. And someone comes up to the podium and they lean across and they look at me and they say, I work at CIA. I think I can get you in. So I'm like, <laughs> awesome. So um, they gave me a first name and a phone number. And, and uh, that was all I could get. And then later, um, they, I contacted them and I said, okay, you know, I, I'd love to give my talk at CIA as long as I get a chance to see cryptos. And I was also wondering, was this just a hacker pulling my chain and pretending to be a CIA agent who wasn't really a CIA agent? So they said, yeah, um, you know, send us your slides. And I said, well, how do I know you really work for CIA? And they said, well, um, you know, how do you want us to prove it? And I said, well, send me an email from an official CIA address. And they said, well, I don't have an email from an official CIA address. And I said, well, get an email from an official <laughs> CIA address. And, and some time goes by, and then I get an email from da -da -da at ucia.gov, unclassifiedcia.gov. So I'm still thinking, okay, is this a hacker pulling my chain? So I, I write back to them, and I, I make sure we have two-way communication. I'm writing to the address, and I'm getting emails from that address. And I send them the slides, and, and I say, I, I want... You know, I'll, I'll give you the talk, but I want time to look at crypto. So, so then there's this lo long story short back and forth about um, I didn't want to be paid, and that was against government policy. I had to be paid. And I'm like, what? This is my tax money. I'm saying I don't want to be paid. They said, well, you have to be paid. I'm like, okay, fine, pay me. And they paid me $2,500. There's <laughs> your tax money at work, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, so um, I got to go to CIA. I got to see cryptos. And uh, I, I hadn't done, I hadn't worked much on it at that point, and I, uh, I did some rubbings of the sculpture, and I had some pictures of me by an official CIA photographer, and I went home to St. Louis. I'm like, okay, done. Um, somebody might be interested in seeing my rubbings. I'll post them on the web. 
sort of like an early blog, Ilanka's visit to CIA. Uh, and, and then I thought I was done with it. But then I started getting emails from all over the world from people saying, you saw cryptos. I'm like, yeah. And they said, I've cracked part four. And I'm like, great, tell me what it is. I'll, I'll put the answer on my website. And they said, well, if you take this letter and this letter and this letter, it's my home address. <laughs> it's proof that the government's watching me. <laughs> and I'd say, well, thank you. Um, and uh, and I, you know, I'd kind of, sometimes I'd kind of correspond a little bit with them about the methods that they were using. And they go, oh, OK, I guess it's you know, other people could find other solutions. I'm like, yeah. And, um, people kept writing to me and asking me lots of questions about the sculpture. So I decided to make an FAQ on my website about cryptos and, and you know, who made it. And people would, who made cryptos? I'd say, a sculptor named Jim Sanborn. And they, they'd say, um, you know, what else has Sanborn ever done? I'm like, I have no idea. And um, people kept asking me. And so then I wrote to Sanborn's agent and I said, hey, can you send me a list of everything Sanborn's ever done? And and they said, that's impossible. I'm like, what, what do you mean? They said, well, he's done too much work, and, and it, you know, it's impossible to make a list. I said, can you send me a partial list? They said, no, we don't even have a partial list. I'm like, OK, I guess I'll make a list of everything Sanborn's ever done. And so I started writing to art galleries all over the country saying, has Sanborn ever shown art at your gallery? And then some would say yes. And I'd say, do you still have a program? And they'd say yes. And I'd say, can you send me a copy? And they'd send me a copy. And it would say Sanborn, who's also done art shows at boom, 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 the following art galleries. And, and so I'd write to them. And bit by bit, I'm compiling this list. And I'm putting it on my website. And then my phone rings. And it's Sanborn. And he's like, who are you? And why do you have a web page about me? <laughs> And I said, no, 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 I'm a big fan. And, and, we t and now we're, we, we talk, I'm actually the, the public conduit. When he wants to announce something, he calls me. And then I'm the one that goes and talks to the New York Times and all those people. So, so this, it was just kind of a, a, an organic flow in my life that started at DragonCon as I got more and more involved with the, the history of, of crypto. So it's still, it's been 20 years now since I heard about it. It's still four codes, three of the four have been solved, fourth hasn't been solved yet. Um, but I will tell you about what we know, I'll tell you what those three parts say. Um, and while I was working on cryptos, one of the other questions I would get is how famous is cryptos? So I said, is there a list of famous unsolved codes? Not really. So I made a list of the world's most famous unsolved codes by a completely arbitrary standard. Um, I, I didn't have anything strict and mathematical. I basically went through all my books about cryptography and looked up to see what was listed in the index. And then I kind of Googled to see what were the big hits. So. This is my list, um, where the number one is something called the Beale Ciphers. It was actually on a show called Myth Hunters over the last year, if anybody So You can go on Netflix, and, and you can see that. I'm one of the talking heads. Um, and then the second most famous was something called the Voynich Manuscript. I have a copy of it up here, and I'll be t speaking more about that. Dorbella Cipher, Zodiac Killer, a serial killer in California, and then Cryptos, and then some others. So I'm going to be speaking today about the Voynich Manuscript and about Cryptos. Um, and if you go to my website, elonka.com, you can find out more about all these. So first, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more about the Voynich manuscript. So we see here it's hundreds of pages of this script that we cannot read. We, this manuscript, um, we believe, is about 500, 600 years old. A script we cannot read. An alphabet we don't recognize. We've never found anything else in this alphabet either. Um, we have done some radiocarbon dating on the pages. So we know the animals from whom the vellum was made. It, it came from um, calfskin. Those animals lived between 1408 and 1438. We know it's 232 pages long of what remains, but we, we don't recognize it. The reason it's called the Voynich Manuscript is it, became to, it came to public attention in 1912 when a Polish-American book dealer named Wilfred Voynich purchased it. There was a monastery, uh, the Villa Mandogoni in Italy, south of Rome, that was running low on funds. Um, so they were kind of discreetly selling some of their library. And, and Voynich went there, and he saw this manuscript, and, and he, he became interested in it. He called it the ugly duckling of the manuscripts, because it didn't, it didn't have all that gold, you know, marginalia, uh, religious symbology there. But it was plants. 
and in a language that no, it wasn't Latin, it wasn't Greek. No one, could, no one could figure out what it said. And these plants were not really identifiable. We've shown it to botanists, and they'll say something like, oh, yeah, I recognize those flowers, but those flowers wouldn't have those kinds of leaves. Or, or that root system would never support that particular kind of, of plant. They, they all tend to be small kind of herbal plants. They're, we don't see large trees or, or crawling vines, really. So it's a mystery. <laughs> we, we don't know what it is. Um, people have been working on it for generations. Even some of the famous code breakers, uh, uh, the Freedmans, who cracked ciphers in the World Wars, could not crack the code that was in the Voynich manuscript. Just a couple more kind of plants. And aside, along with the plants, there were also these interesting di diagrams of little naked women in, in green tubs, uh, tubs of green water. And the tubs always had an inflow and an outflow. There's a very specific thing of flowing water going through here. You can see coming down the side as well, water's flowing from one place to another, to another, to another. But again, it's a mystery. What exactly does this mean? The, the, the plants are also this big curiosity because some of them, they look like almost recognizable. Like anybody that knows about flowers knows about passion flowers, which have 10 petals. And this sort of looks like a passion flower, but it has five petals. Why would it have five petals instead of 10? Why would it just be a little bit off? If we were to translate the script of the Voynich manuscript into something that we could see in our alphabet. This is sort of the pattern that it would be. Uh, I, I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but it's got this thing that looks like words. But again, it, it's, it's not something that we can read. Also, there's no punctuation anywhere throughout the Voynich manuscript. It does have a similarity to other things we would call herbal manuscripts. So this is a, another manuscript. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure about pronoun Materia Medica in the 15th century with pictures of herbal plants. Um, these would be written in Latin or they'd be written in Arabic as well, and sometimes they'd be copied from one language to another. So the Voynich manuscript sort of looks like that. Maybe somebody was just schizophrenic and was trying to make something that they thought was going to be helpful, but it didn't, it, it didn't mean anything to anyone else. Um, here's also a picture of the, the passion flower, and you can see it, it's almost there. It's like almost there. Um, the Voynich manuscript is currently in the Yale University Library, the rare book library, Beinecke rare book library. Very rarely comes out. It came out once last year. I got a chance to see it. Um, so they had it in the glass case there. And I've actually made a full copy of it with all the pages and which way that they fold out or not. So I, I was just very happy to compare mine with what was there. That's the, the real manuscript. It was also interesting looking at it. When I, I looked at it from another angle, you can see the edges there. They've got these loops. So it was like it, it, it didn't have that even cut look that you would see in most manuscripts, even older manuscripts. It, it had a very much um, like it was a collection more than, more than it was a book. The, um, one of the big fold-out pages, this is called the Rosettes page, uh, and it, it, it's, it's bizarre. I mean, gamers here are going to look at it and go, oh, it's a map. You know, it's a map. You're going from one area to another. Maybe there's waves coming up on these uh, areas in between circles. One clue about where the manuscript might have been comes from one section up in one of the, there, th there's a circle and you're looking around, you're seeing things sideways and this is obviously a castle looking at the side. And if you look at the, uh, the defensive things, they they don't have that strict square wave. They have this kind of loop. And that's a specific architectural element that's called a swallowtail merlon. Today you can see it in castles all over, but at that time in the 1400s it was really only in one area and that was in northern Italy. So that <coughs> might be a clue about where it's from. <laughs> we don't know. Um, so is it real? I. Is, is it a hoax? Did it, does it mean something? Um, like I said, we, we've carbon dated it. We've traced it back, like who owned it, who owned it, who owned it, all, as far back as we can. And we've got something that's not firm, but it's pretty solid, that it was purchased by the Emperor Rudolf in 16th century for 600 gold ducats, ducats, um, which would be about $80,000 today. Now, the, so it's possible that it was created 
to be sold to the emperor. He was known to collect curiosities. So maybe someone created a really interesting curiosity to sell to the emperor. Um, again, we don't know. Um, so is maybe it's a hoax, but if someone did a hoax, it's a really elaborate hoax because it probably took years to make. Um, when the Freedmans looked at it, William, the really famous code breaker, William Friedman, said he thought it was an artificial language. Um, but we haven't been able to do anything more with that since then, and some of the patterns don't really match for an artificial language. It's possible, again, that it was a, a, someone who was schizophrenic who was just drawing it, but it's got these regular patterns. Also, if it was someone who's schizophrenic, they must have been in a family of means because this was not cheap to make. You got to think all this vellum, hundreds of pages of vellum, um, and also just the access to the, the dyes and the, the inks, and they had the, the free time in order to make this. Um, or it's encrypted. Why? I, people ask me, you know, wh what do I think about the Voynich? And my opinion kind of changes on a daily basis. You know, one day I'll say, oh, it was a hoax. Another day I'll go, oh, it's get someone is schizophrenic. Another day I'll go, oh, maybe it was encrypted. Maybe it was. Um, a family in Italy that was selling herbal uh, you know, potions and creams that were designed to, uh, like, like snake oil, that people should buy to heal them. You got to think 1400s. It's about 100 years after the 1300s, the Black, the Black Death, the plague. Maybe people were more health conscious. And when people bought creams uh, to heal them, the price of the cream was directly related to the rarity of the herbs that were used to make that cream. So maybe someone made this as a, as a sales catalog. Like, look, you see this, it, it comes from very far away, very expensive. Um, we don't know, maybe someone had visions, they, were, they thought angels were talking to them. Maybe if they were um, mixing and matching herbs, think of also the, um, trying to make the Philosopher's Stone. Alchemy was big then, mixing and matching different metals. Maybe they were mixing and matching different kinds of, of herbs and they were encoding their stuff. They were trying to avoid the Inquisition. So, so that's pretty much all I'm gonna say about the Voynich. Um, you know, maybe Northern Italy, Northern Italy, we don't know what it says. We don't know what alphabet it is, but it is called the world's most mysterious manuscript. So there you have it. So, going on to Kryptos. Um, it was commissioned in 1988. It was dedicated in 1990. Sanborn did not know anything about codes at the time. Um, the CIA was in the process. They'd had their original headquarters building, and then they were needed a new headquarters building that they were expanding into in the 1980s. So they were getting a new building. And along with the building, there's this thing where you have to have art around the building. It, it's just a requirement. And in some buildings today in, in big cities, they create the building and they get a tax break if they have art. So they just go out and say, hey, we need art. And, and artists will go forward and put sculptures. So you'll see these odd modern things that really don't mean anything, but it's art, it's art. And so they, they get a lower tax bracket. Um, and uh, so the uh, CIA went to the General Services Administration and they had a committee that created a committee that created a committee to get artists to create sculptures around the, sea, around the headquarters. And that committee chose Jim Sanborn. He already had a reputation for creating art around various government buildings. And in his, <clears throat> in his art shows, he also liked dealing with invisible forces. It was something he'd always been intrigued with. For example, you could go into an art gallery and one of his shows would be a, a room with hundreds of threads hanging from the ceiling and from each of these threads hung a needle. And all of these needles, which were not attached, all of them were all pointing in the same direction because at the far end of the room there was a lodestone. So it was his way of trying to take the invisible force of magnetism and show you what was there. And he did this for magnetism, he did this with, with geothermal forces, he did it with um, all, all kinds of different things in the natural world. 
And the, the committee that was choosing artists chose him because they liked that idea that he was making invisible things visible because they felt that it kind of matched with the, the CIA's mission, making invisible things visible. So, so he was hired and he came in and he looked around, he did some research on CIA and then he decided he wanted to do a sculpture called Kryptos, which is Greek for the word hidden. And <clears throat> the director of the CIA at the time was a man named William Webster. And he teamed Sanborn with Ed Scheidt. Ed Scheidt was the chairman of the CIA Cryptographic Center. And Scheidt spent a couple months with Sanborn teaching him about codes, teaching him some, some basic codes. And then Sanborn decided what he wanted to encrypt. And when he went down to the southwest United States to gather stones, uh, sandstone and whatnot, to put around the sculpture, that's on his way back. He, he started carving the message into the sculpture. He encrypted it, and then it took him a couple years to actually carve all the letters. They were all carved by hand. So this is one of the rubbings that I did when I was there. Each one of these is done on an 8.5 by 11 inch piece of paper. It gives you an idea of the size of the letters. And um, the, uh, when it was installed uh, in uh, 1990, the CIA put out a challenge to the NSA the National Security Agency to see if they could crack it. NSA is super secretive agency. The joke is it stands for no such agency. And yeah, the deputy director of the NSA, or the, the deputy director of the CIA had previously worked at the NSA. This was Admiral Studman. And he went back to the NSA and he said, okay, you guys think you're so hot. Let's see how hot you are. And then the NSA's director, who was Admiral John Mike McConnell, he took up the challenge and they put together a four-person team um, and they ran computer attacks. They were not able to solve all four parts. They were only able to solve three of the parts. They sent their memo to the CIA and then they said they're done. So. I'm making my website, right? I'm gathering all the information that I can about Sanborn, about cryptos. And I hear about this NSA effort and I think, oh, I'd love to see that memo. So, so I write to the NSA and I say, hey, can I see that memo? And they say, no. And I go, okay. So I say, why? And they say, well, it's classified. And I'm like, okay, this is a recreational cipher. There's, this is not a matter of national security. Why is it classified? And they say, well, we can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I would like to see this memo. There's no reason that this memo should be classified. And, and they kept saying no. And I'm like, OK. So I file a Freedom of Information Act request on the NSA. So, so this is the story of my Freedom of Information Act request, my, my effort. So I file this, this FOIA request on the NSA in March 2010. In April, I get, I get a nice message back saying, OK, you know, are you willing to pay the search fees? I'm like, OK. A <clears throat> couple months go by, and I say, and I get a little letter. It says, "Our search is completed. You have been placed in the first in, first out processing queue for non-personal easy cases. But since there were several cases ahead of mine, they were unable to respond within 20 days." I'm like, okay, fine. Six months go by. <laughs> I write back to the NSA, and they say, yeah, and I say, how's it going? And they say, oh, the reference case is actively being worked and, in fact, has already made it through the first level of review. There are additional review and approval stages, and there are other cases ahead of yours, so it may be some time before you receive a response. I'm like, okay. Another six months go by, I write back and they say, oh, it's in the final approval stages. I write back six months later and says, oh, your case is in the final approval stages, but there are a number of cases ahead of yours in that queue. So I was contacting some of my friends in the government and they were saying, Ilanka, this is NSA speak for go away. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not going away. <laughs> so I kept writing back and I kept writing back and finally, about uh, three years later, I get a big fat manila envelope in the mail that is the memo from NSA to CIA, to CIA. And it has lots of information. Some of it is redacted, but and it's now on the web. It's public. But I want to say, approved for release by NSA on May 21st, 2013, FOIA case 61191. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So I read through the report, and it said basically what I knew, that there were four codes, three of the four had been solved, the fourth was still not solved. 
and and so I'm, I'm you know where else do we go from here and so uh, some of the other things I, I was checking on I found out as I was collecting this list of other things that other artwork that Sanborn had created that after he'd created Cryptos he created another encrypted piece he'd done no encrypted pieces before Cryptos this was his first piece with encryption first piece with text on it okay but after he created Cryptos he created something that he called the untitled Cryptos piece and it was sold to various private collectors so I tracked it down and it was in the home of a dot-com millionaire who was in Los Angeles in his backyard and so I called him up and I said hi I'm Ilanka um, can I come in and take pictures of the art in your backyard and he said sure and um, I found a couple interesting things about it. So along, also along with the untitled piece, there was another piece. So the, the one at the top is different from the one at the bottom. The one at the bottom is about 20% taller. And that one is at the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, D.C. So if you go to D.C. and there's that big oval museum that's on the mall, this is outside the front door of that one. And what I found was that there's two sides of it. One side, the text is all the text that's on crypto, so it's in the, the Roman alphabet. Um, the other side is all the Cyrillic alphabet, and it's also in code. And I found the code that's on that side is repeated on another of Sanborn sculptures, which is called the Cyrillic projector. This one is in Charlotte. Anybody here from Charlotte? Sometimes. Okay. This is at the uh, University of North Carolina, Charlotte, in between the Friday and the Fretwell buildings. And it has the Cyrillic text that's on the untitled Cryptos piece. And it beams encrypted text all around the courtyard. So going back to the untitled Cryptos piece, the sections are in a different order. And don't worry, I'll, I'll get to what they say. The sections are in a different order than are on Cryptos. So where Cryptos might go one, two, three, four, this would go three, four, one, two, three, four, and then it kind of chops off. Um, and they're aligned differently. And also the untitled version has two extra dots. So so here you'll see where it says E-N-D-Y-A-H-R. That's the beginning of part three of Cryptos. And about halfway down, there's an area with two dots. So the encrypted text is identical to what's on Cryptos, except this one has dots and the one on Cryptos doesn't. Maybe it's a clue, maybe it's not, don't know. So if we're on Cryptos, it would be on that upper left plate about in the, in the lower right-hand quadrant. So let me go over what the other two plates of cryptos are, which is called a visionaire table, named after Blaise de Visionnaire. Actually, yeah, anyway, it's named after Blaise de Visionnaire. And you get these diagonals. So the way it goes together is if you take the normal alphabet, you have 26 letters, A through Z, and then you're going to take a key word. In this case, the key word is the word cryptos. So you take the letters, K-R-Y-P-T-O-S, you put them over at the left, and you leave the rest of the alphabet there. So you still have 26 letters. They're just scrambled in a specific way. Okay. And then if you line up those letters in diagonal, so each line is shifted by one, so you have the cryptos key alphabet going all the way down. And in this, get my mouse going. You can see the word cryptos here. And also, if you read down vertically, you can also see the word cryptos. Did you see that? OK. So for part one of cryptos, what he did is he didn't have the word cryptos going down the side. He spelled another word, which was palimpsest. Where, so these lines were all shifted in different ways. So you would take the P here and make that at the far left-hand column. And you would take the A here and make that at the far left-hand column. So part one of cryptos is these top two lines here. So you have the letters, I don't know if you can see them, E-M-U-F-P-H-C, all right? So E-M-U-F-P-H-C, and then we have our cryptos tableau. So we're using the cryptos alphabet, but we're spelling down the left-hand column the word palimpsest, right? And then you take this E-M-U-F-P and you put it on the tableau. You put E-M-U-F-P. And then you go up, so the E becomes a B, the M becomes an E, the U becomes a T, the F becomes a W, and so forth, all right? So E-M-U-F-P-H-Z becomes B-E-T-W-E-E-N, between, 
Right? And you keep doing that and you repeat the tableau over and over and over and you can pull out the entire message that way. So part one, what we call K1 of cryptos, this is the ciphertext using the keywords, the keys of cryptos and palimpsest, comes out to say between subtle shading and the absence of light lies the nuance of illusion. Now, there's a cue there on my slide. It's not a typo on my slide. That's what cryptos decrypts to. I asked Sanborn if that was a mistake, and he said, no, it's deliberate. But it's not what it is that's so important. It's where it is. It's the orientation or the position. We don't know what that means, but that's what he said. <laughs> all right. Part two starts at line three and goes all the way down to the bottom of this plate. This is the ciphertext of part two. Now, he did admit a few years ago that there is a mistake in this one, that he left a letter out at the bottom. There's an S that he left out. And because of the way this is put together with the shifted lines, that actually comes out to be a very, all the letters after it come out to say something very different. So this one was two different keys, cryptos and abscissa. Abscissa is a mathematical term that means the x-coordinate on a graph. Um, palimpsest, by the way, is a word for a scroll that has had one message written on it. Then that message is scraped off and another message is put on it. So you kind of see bits of the old message showing through. Um, so with cryptos and abscissa, it was totally invisible. How is that possible? They use the Earth's magnetic field, X. The information was gathered and transmitted underground to an unknown location, X. Does Langley know about this? They should. It's buried out there somewhere, X. Who knows the exact location? Only WW. This was his last message, X. 38 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north. 77 degrees, 8 minutes, 44 seconds west. ID by Rose. Or we thought it said ID by Rose until we heard about the S. And then we, what it really says is X. Layer two, which is not much more helpful, but that's what he says it's supposed to say. All right. Part three starts at the top of this plate, goes down to about the fourth row. This is the cipher text for part three. And some of you may notice that the text looks a little different than the cipher text for part one and part two. There's more vowels here, T's. Um, fewer Q's and X's. So this is a different system instead of the substitution system of parts one and two. This is a transposition system. All the letters of the message are there. You just need to figure out what method to unscramble them. So one method I came up with was to put them all into rows and then start here on the far right with the S and then count down by four to an L, down by four to an O, around to a W, down by four to an L. So S, L, O, W, L, Y, slowly. And you keep doing that, you get these lovely diagonals, slowly, desperately. So the plain text for part three is, slowly, desperately, slowly, the remains of passage debris that encumbered the lower part of the doorway was removed. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner. And then, widening the hole a little, I inserted the candle and peered in. The hot air escaping from the chamber caused the flame to flicker, but presently details of the room within emerged from the mist. X. Can you see anything? Q. Anybody recognize that? Carter, Howard Carter, very good. This is a paraphrased extract from the diary of Howard Carter, archaeologist Howard Carter, on November 26, 1922, the day he discovered King Tut's tomb. And Sanborn liked this because he felt that uh, uncovering a tomb or uncovering something hidden was very similar to cracking a code. You're peeling away the layers. Then there's part four. There's the cipher text. I can't tell you what the plain text is. Nobody knows. So part four would be at the very bottom of this plate. That was when I was there. So the coordinates, 38 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north. Where do those point? They point to an area in the courtyard with cryptos, not at cryptos itself. Some people thought that. But 
the uh, the 6.5 seconds north is interesting. Anybody here a geocacher? Yep. Okay, so you know that a tenth of second of latitude is a very specific location, about 10 feet across. And this is 6.5 seconds, not 6.6, .6, not 6.4. Very specific location. So it points to an area about 150 feet southeast of Kryptos, right about here in the courtyard. So this is the original headquarters building. This is the new headquarters building. The white building with the alien-shaped roof is the cafeteria. And so the employees of the CIA, as they're eating in the cafeteria, can look outside the, these, this row of windows and see the courtyard. There's a green area. There's a duck pond. There's some slabs created by Sanborn. Sanborn designed this entire courtyard area. And these slabs in the duck pond all point right at Cryptos, right there. This is another view. Again, cafeteria, new headquarters building. Cryptos is right there. Sanborn also designed some slabs that are out here in the front courtyard area. And these are big slabs tilted out of the ground as though they're from some sort of a geological seam. Um, and they've got Morse code messages on metal plates in between the slabs. They say things like SOS, shadow forces, lucid memory, T is your position. And Sanborn has said that those messages relate to K2, the second part. But he hasn't said how they relate. Um, there's also several other pieces. He's got a... Um, a slab with a compass rose carved, but the compass rose is not aligned to north. Uh, we ha he has created a couple other pieces that add compass roses, and we've gone and looked to see if they all point somewhere, but um, they don't seem to, to link anywhere. We think that's just sort of his signature, that he likes to put a compass rose. Um, so again, the, the coordinates point to about here, and this is kind of just lining out where everything is. It's possible that he's got this diagonal here and this diagonal here, and you're supposed to draw like this big parallelogram and that he meant to point over here. The, he talks sometimes about a, um, he used a, a United States Geological Survey mark that was somewhere in the area. So possibly we're supposed to go use these to find that mark. It, we don't know. Also, it's interesting that of these three blocks, these have Morse codes, these have Morse codes, this one does not. It's the, the unmarked triangle block. It looks sort of like an arrowhead. We don't know if it's related or not. Uh, a couple other interesting things. On the visioneer side of the tableau, there's an extra L. So this line should end with J, but instead ends with L. So there's two lines that end with L. This line is also directly across from a line where there's some out of alignment letters. I'll show you those. It's, it's possibly did this to draw the eyes to that specific line. We don't know. Um, when he did the Cyrillic projector, and we, we cracked this, and one of the keys was the word Medusa. And <coughs> if you stand in the courtyard, you will see the word Medusa, which if anyone here knows Cyrillic, you will see that's not Cyrillic. There's letters here which do not appear in the Cyrillic alphabet. Um, so those letters, where do they come from? They come from the third line of this cylinder. On that cylinder is an extra bolt. It's hard to see on the outside, but if you look from the inside, it's really obvious. So it's possible he put that there again to draw the eyes. We don't know. Um, <clears throat> Ed Scheidt, who designed the code systems, he said he did things to mask the English in part four, that we had solved the first three parts. We'd had the advantage of the English language and the patterns of the English language, but he'd removed that. So he said first we needed to, to discover the masking t technique that was used before we could go on to crack the rest of part four. Um, he also said he used a little bit of steganography, but he did say it's English. That they, He and Sanborn discussed making it in Assyrian or, or ancient Babylonian or something. And he said, no, it is English, it is solvable, and it uses all the letters. So years go by, it's still not solved. Sanborn announced a hint for characters 64 through 69. <coughs> These letters, he say, equate to the word Berlin. We asked him, does it really mean Berlin, or does it mean like Amber Line? Like, is it two other words? He said, no, it's Berlin. It's the city. And we were able to find out we can get the word Berlin to appear there, 
by using like that same visionary system but with the keys of shifted and binary. We get the word Berlin there but nothing intelligible before or after. There's also lots of other key letters that will get the word Berlin to appear there. You know, Athwart, Lenin, uh, algorithmic gratefulness. So we don't know if that's a coincidence or not. Um, yeah, I told you, it, it, it is the word Berlin. Um, he also gave us another hint, which is that after Berlin is the word clock. So now we have about 10% of the plain text from the cipher. We still can't solve it. Um, we don't know. We don't know. We've gone researching lots of Berlin clocks to see if there <laughs> might be any hint. Uh, has, Sam Ward has said there's lots of interesting clocks in Berlin, but yeah. Um, the alignment, I also want to point out there are these letters that are slightly out of alignment. Um, got a rubbing of those. And s when I showed these slides to Sanborn, he did say it's important. But again, we don't know what that means. Also interesting, when I showed him this picture of cryptos, he said, don't use that picture, it's ugly. I thought, what do you mean? He said, you're looking at it from the wrong side. Like, what? And he said, uh, and we kinda w which is the front? And he said, this is the front. So I don't know if that's because we get this nice kind of compass rose, you know, the, the lat long grid. I don't know, but that is the front. Um, one speculation about Berlin, the sculpture was being created right about the time that the Berlin Wall came down. <coughs> so we were wondering if the coordinates were pointing to a place that was going to have a monument to the Berlin Wall because the CIA is sort of involved with that. Um, CIA does have a Berlin Wall monument. Um, before you get too excited about the Berlin Wall and the graffiti, this is not real graffiti. The Berlin CIA received blank slabs and then hired an artist to paint graffiti onto these slabs. Notice it's all in English as well. Um, but, it, but this is a monument at CIA. Today, that monument is about here. Maybe at the time it was supposed to be at the, at the location of the coordinates. We don't know. It was installed about two years after Kryptos was created. So um, part four, don't know what it says. A little bit about Kryptos and pop culture, a uh, book called The Da Vinci Code. There are, in the artwork of the book, The Da Vinci Code, there are five codes hidden in the artwork of the book jacket. Um, and this is something Dan Brown does to give clues to the topic of his next novel. Two of those clues in Da Vinci Code refer to cryptos. So if you look on the back, where there's sort of a, a brown tear mark, it's the words only WW knows, referring to the text of part two. And on next to the blurbs on the left, hard to see, light red on dark red, 37 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north, 77 degrees, 8 minutes, 44 seconds west. <clears throat> so these are giving clues to his next book, the lost symbol. I did help Dan Brown with the research for the novel, and he thanked me by naming a character after me in the novel. There's a character named Nola Kay, which is Ilanka, scrambled. So uh, summarizing, why hasn't part four been solved yet? Well, it's short, just 97 characters. Um, and it's difficult to find patterns. Cryptographers and generally need large amounts of text to work with. It was also never, Cryptos was never intended as a public challenge. It, so it's possible that there's some key on site at CIA that is needed and it, it's difficult to get on site at CIA, big guys with guns and lots of barbed wire. Um, we also, it's possible we've missed something or we've been misdirected. Maybe Scheidt has said it's English, maybe it's French or Spanish or, or Arabic, we don't know. It al it's also possible that he screwed something up. It might have a mistake. At this point, I'm pretty sure it's accurate because we've beat on him so much. And he did admit that he had the mistake in part two. Um, so um, three, three of the four parts have been solved. Um, and we may have been misdirected. But both Sanborn and Scheidt have said it is solvable. And my goal is not necessarily to solve it, but I want to see it solved. <laughs> I want it off my plate. So if I can do this by helping other people, by giving them information about cryptos, uh, I, I'm happy to do so. If you want more information, there's a Cryptos Yahoo group. <clears throat> you can join by sending an email to cryptos-subscribe at yahoogroups.com. I have a website, elanka.com slash cryptos. You can Google. There's a wonderful documentary on PBS, on Nova Science Now. Uh, there's also a book that was written after 
uh, the lost symbol where there's a couple articles in there written by me uh, about cryptos so you can get more information there and if you just want to learn more about cryptography my number one recommendation is a book by Simon Singh called The Code Book. Excellent introduction to cryptography. If you want more information, go to David Kahn's book, The Code Breaker. And if you want online information, go to the website of Bruce Schneier. He does the modern stuff, the uh, long prime number multiplication stuff. And he has a monthly newsletter called Cryptogram that I, I highly recommend. Okay, questions? We, we've got like, what, five minutes for questions? Yeah? yeah five, minutes. five minutes. Yes. Put in a lot of effort to kind of solve part four, because you're obviously capable if you probably really worked on it. There's no handle on this. You are very kind. Uh, so, so the question was, um, why, have, why haven't I solved K4? Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, or at least tried. Uh, I've tried. I've tried. Uh, I've tried. I, there's, uh, I'd say, about a thousand people in our discussion group worldwide, and we've tried. And I've, um, we've tried modern methods. We've tried historical methods. I've tried taking the artist out for drinks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I, I think someone smarter than I or someone more creative than I. I think with a lot of these codes, I think that the people that have received college degrees in cryptology have tried to crack this. The people with the big computers have tried to crack this. It hasn't been cracked. So I think it's going to be someone who's going to come up with an idea out of left field, someone who's a, a gardener or um, a, a chef or, yeah, a, a kid, a, a kid, yeah. So, but thank you. You think I'm smart enough to do it. I'll take that as, as a compliment. <laughs> okay, so I kind of forget the name of the first one that the... Voynich Manuscript? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you guys have probably tried every possible thing to solve it, but, like, is it possible it was, like, a dead language or, like, you know, um, they thought maybe they were crossbreeding flowers or herbs mm -hmm. or whatever to try and get that I mean I don't know that's just what I was thinking is it possible that that could have been what they were trying to do or is it it's it's very very possible it, it's possible a dead language it's also possible in good questions it's also possible that it's micro languages like Europe has all these little micro countries some of them have disappeared entirely over the years maybe there was a little country that had its own language and has vanished and all of its writings have disappeared and the only reason that this survived is because it's pretty um, and um, so, and maybe they were, maybe they were trying to do some crossbreeding of plants. You're absolutely right. By the way, anyone that wants to see a copy of the Voynich is welcome to come up later and, and take a look. But good questions. Uh, my question about the Voynich is, uh, you said that they that he bought it from a monastery. Why did the monastery have it? Uh, that's that's a good question. We think that what happened is that from Emperor Rudolph's. Uh, collection where also if you take the first pa first page of the Voynich and there's a blank spot at the bottom and you use you look at it in black light you can see a name come up it's Tepanich and Tepanich was the royal botanist to Emperor Rudolph so we think that it was in Emperor Rudolph's collection for a while I think until um, I think there was a war that went through um, I forget which war, <laughs> so many wars. Um, but I think that uh, the documents of the library were then kind of packaged up and placed somewhere else and then moved to location to location and eventually ended up in the Villa Mondragoni Monastery. And from there, they weren't really using it, and so they kind of were discreetly selling some in the early 1900s. Do you think at any time Sanborn and them will tell? I mean, we're all going to get old one day, and you know, eventually no one's going to, it won't have the same myth behind it I mean you think in his will or the man who created it or that they will leave the answer or as he said it seems like to me I read yeah. that he said mm -hmm. within a certain time he would finally yeah. reveal it or um, it, he changes his answer okay. <laughs> so um, at times he has said that um, uh, he he offered the answer to William Webster at the time that the sculpture was created. Uh, what he did is he took the answer and he cut it up into little pieces and put it into an envelope 
and handed it off to Webster at the dedication ceremony. Webster then handed it off to his, I believe, director of public relations who carried around with him. And I've been trying to find out what did you do with it? Or did it just kind of go in the trash at some point? Um, <clears throat> today, Sanborn has said that he's got the answer in two safe deposit boxes. Um, one with extended family, one on the East Coast, one in the Southwest United States. The question, the really interesting question then is, how do they know when to open the safe deposit box? Like if someone goes to them and says, I have solved it, how does that cousin know that they're sure they've solved it without knowing the answer in order to open the safe deposit box? So what he's got is something called the K4 test. So if someone goes up to the relative and says, I've solved it, the relative has asked them, like, what's the 50th letter? What's the 53rd letter? And if someone can answer those questions correctly, then it will be sufficient proof that they've solved it so that then it can be compared against the actual solution. Um, I believe that that won't be necessary at that point. If someone has a method to solve it, other people will be able to use that method to derive the same answer, sort of like the guy who said it was his home address. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, other people, I said, I ask people, and I get people write to me probably about once a week saying they've solved K4. And I always say, OK, your answer is now time stamped. You wrote to me at 2 PM on this day. Now you know, give me the, the first word and the last word. And then I say, OK, give me a method by which this was derived. And then if other people can use that method to get those same words, OK, you've got it. We'll do the press release. But, but it always falls apart. Or people will send me something and say, OK, well, here's my method. And their method just gives us garbage text. Or their method doesn't have the word Berlin in it or clock in it. And, and yeah, so the, the process just continues. But Sanborn, sometimes he says he wants um, he wants it to be solved, and sometimes he says he wants to die knowing it's still unsolved, to which several members of my group say, okay, we can make this happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, another question in the back. Hi, oh, thank yes. you. Um, is it possible when he told you that he didn't like the ugly picture, that he wanted it viewed from the front? Right. You mentioned that that compass on the front, the, right. the cross. The grid. Mm -hmm. Is it is it possible that there's that the mathematics of the curve of the stat of the statue, the height, the width, that any of that could possibly play in those numbers to the letters to the characters? Um, it, it's absolutely possible. All these all these things. He, he's also done a, he's done a lot of things with light projection. Maybe that has something to do with it. Um, because like the Cirilla projector beams the light. The, the curve. It's possible. Um, it, it's possible. Anything's possible. He's done many sculptures that have that same curve because I think he works with companies that can make cylindrical um, sculptures. And so the curve is always a cylinder. You can take the curve, and if you put the two curves together, you get a cylinder. Then again, it might have something to do with it. So I'm not going to shoot down any ideas. Any other up here in the front? There's supposedly a common theme that once you solve the fourth one, there'll be some message that you can take from, from the first, second, and third stanza with the fourth one. Uh, is there any indication or do you have any, any guesses what that's going to be or, or at least what it's trending towards or do you really need the fourth one to be able to figure out what the common thread is? Yeah, Sanborn has said that even after we solve the fourth part, there, fourth part, there will be a further mystery to be solved. And it, it's important to him that art always have always leaves something else to be discovered. He says in any piece of art that if someone looks at it and they understand everything about that piece of art, then the artist has failed. So um, can we figure out what's going on after that? He has referred to something that he did or could have done at the site of CIA headquarters. So maybe maybe he buried, I don't think he buried something because they were watching him too closely and they, they didn't like people burying small un, you know, unmarked boxes on CIA grounds. <laughs> um, but uh, he, did, he has spoken many times about using those USGS uh, survey markers. So it may have something to do with that. But he's also contacted me recently within the last couple of years it's, he said he went back to inspect the sculpture and he said the topography has changed he said the the layout of the gardens there is different and that this is important to him so maybe whatever he meant for us to find is no longer findable um, I don't know I don't know okay. any other questions 
All right. I think we can probably do one more question. So, yes. You said that he designed the entire garden, correct? And then, yes. Um, so if theoretically he, um, we could go back and look at the entire garden <coughs> when it was originally designed with Google satellite images. Um, if we did that and um, we found what it looked like then, we could probably figure that out. Um, do you have the picture that um, he said was the one that he liked on your website? I do. Wonderful. Thank okay, you. yes, I have a lot more information at, at my website, ilanka.com slash cryptos um, and I guess one takeaway is from my own life's journey here is there were a lot of people who said no you can't do that <laughs> and I would go ahead and do it anyway and then I would kind of discover other interesting things along the way so um, Will Wright a very famous game designer did Sims and SimCity um, he was once asked what is the secret of success and he said pathological persistence so uh, I, I just ask everyone to think about that if you really want to do something just keep on doing it thank you